I just want to mention a couple of things real quickly just as, as we get started. First of all, just want to say um, thank you so much for all your prayers and support. Um, if you didn't um, know, my, my wife's uh, mom, Candace's mom, passed away um, this past week and went home to be with the Savior. And uh, certainly has been uh, some difficult and challenging times, but it's, you know, I think a number of, of you have said it well, that it's, it's a bittersweet moment. Um, if you don't know her story, she's uh, had frontal temple dementia for 11 years, and so um, her faith is sight, and uh, we are thankful that she's uh, with the Savior, because truly... Uh, to die is gain. Um, I also just want to mention, just really quickly, I know a number of you have just been concerned about my, my health, and I just want to just, just kind of just bring this up quickly. I don't like talking about stuff like that, but um, I've, I've had a whole bunch of tests done, and I just want to just let you know everything's come back normal and, um, and, and good and well, and what we're finding out after meeting with doctors and whatnot is that there's a number of individuals that... Um, they, they have COVID. I had COVID three months ago or so. And then uh, about three to six months later, there's a lot of individuals that are dealing with post-COVID fatigue. In fact, after the first service this morning, I had a couple of different individuals who were like, thank you for bringing that up because that's exactly what I've been going through and dealing with. And so um, just, just don't have uh, my normal strength like I would like to have, which is really frustrating at times, to be, to be really honest with you. And... Uh, and uh, so just uh, appreciate your prayers, but just letting you know um, that's, that's what's been going on with me, and I know some of you have been concerned, and, and I appreciate, appreciate your prayers, um, but uh, just not quite at 100%, and so I'm trying to pace myself and, and not physically overdo it, and uh, so I'm thankful. For, I got a bunch of boys, that's for sure. You can pick up the slack, so... Um, but enough about that. I do want to say a special thanks to uh, just all the guys that have um, stepped up and, uh, and helped out to our leaders uh, in the church. And just uh, especially want to thank um, the men who have um, stood up here and rightly divided the word of truth. Um, besides myself, there's been six other guys that have preached this year, all from our church, and they've done a, a fantastic job. And, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of churches that they struggle, that, that pastors um, struggle to, to be able to even get away for one Sunday because there, aren't, there isn't somebody else to, to, to fill that gap. And God has blessed us with men who are willing to, to stand up and exposit God's Word and to teach God's Word. And, and I, I'm just so thankful for that and so appreciate just each, each of them and the preaching team that we have. Um, you know, as, as I've thought about, um, about that concept, um, just of, of having a preaching team, um, I've, I've thought often this year about Ephesians 4.12, which says that the job of leadership is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And I really think that preaching can be a part of that. We need to teach people, uh, teach our, our men to be able to handle, right, rightly handle God's Word. And, and we have a number of guys that can do it and do it really well. And I'm just so thankful uh, for that. Today we're going to continue with our, our series, Words to Live By. And when we put this series together, we did it with our, our series, Twisted Truths, in mind. We did the series, Twisted Truths, and um, when we did that series, we took some passages that were um, difficult passages that people often misinterpret, and we wanted to clarify those passages and walk through those texts, and we did that. And then as, as we thought about that, they said, you know, what if we, we went to some passages that are just just kind of those words to live by that people often run to these passages. They're, they're kind of go-to verses that maybe even uh, some of you have memorized. And so we just wanted to go and hit some of these. Maybe we're not going to hit your, your favorite verse in this series, um, but it's, it's something that we've talked about. Hey, we could come back to this whole concept down the road, and there's just so many different passages that we could go to. So, um, so you might hear some verses that we, we come to down the road. But as we get started this morning, we're going to we're going to quote um, our, our verses from the first couple weeks. Now, uh, come on, let's be honest. How many people, like Paul had you hook, line, and sinker last week, right? <laughs> right? We're all laughing because he got most of us. Um, in fact, first service, so I was, I was in both services last week. 
first service, I had no idea he was going to do this, right? And I was sitting right about where Pat Hinchy is sitting back there. And Keith Hager was sitting right behind me. And Paul starts going into that description. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to mess these, if I get, I'm going to mess these verses up. And, um, and so I'm flipping through my Bible. I can hear Keith behind me. He's flipping through his, and he's like, hey, you know, he got us really good. So now I'm, I'm a really nice guy, so I won't do anything like that or tease you at all like that. And no, I'm just kidding. Paul's a great guy. Really appreciated that. Um, and what a great laugh that was. So let's, let's quote together um, our verses. Let's, let's go back to a couple of weeks ago, Tanner. Uh, walked us through Psalm 4610, which says this. Let's say it together. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yeah, what a great, great passage. And then last week's verse uh, was Psalm 63, verse 3, which says this. Because, say it together, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Amen. Amen. So this morning we're going to jump to Lamentations chapter 3. It's on page 401 if you're using the Bibles under the chairs around you. And uh, this, this book is not referenced very often, but many times when this book is referenced, it's referenced with these verses. Lamentations chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 22 and verse 23, which says this. In fact, let's let's read it together off the screen. Let's read it together. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. Amen. What a great truth. Before we dive into that text this morning, I want to kind of lay a little bit of, of groundwork for us this morning. Nearly all scholars and commentators believe that the book of Lamentations was written by the, uh, the prophet Jeremiah. And um, in Jeremiah's book comes right before Lamentations. And it's, it's kind of a long, longer prophet book there. And then you have Lamentations, which is shorter. But Lamentations is, is almost written like a postscript to the book of Jeremiah. And uh, in both Jeremiah and Lamentations, Jeremiah writes in in a couple of different spots that his eyes flowed with tears. His eyes flowed with tears as he watched as an eyewitness the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonian Empire and all the horrific acts that accompanied the fall. In fact, if you're to go through and you're to read some of the things that took place as uh, Jerusalem was besieged, and, and to read some of the awful, awful, awful things that took place, you, you might not want to read it to your kids. It's pretty difficult to read in some places. Awful, terrible things that took place. But it was all because of sin. In fact, the book of Lamentations, it, it's written as a lament, right? The idea of, of weeping, of mourning. And it's written as a lament over over the downfall of Jerusalem, but it's also written as a lament over the sin that brought the destruction. In fact, Chuck Swindoll says this, it is a mute reminder that sin, in spite of all its allurement and excitement, carries with it heavy weights of sorrow, grief, misery, barrenness, and pain. And it was the sin of Judah in the city of Jerusalem that led to the destruction. And Jeremiah, he, he's, he's grieving over the sin. He's grieving over the fall. He's grieving over the consequences that have come from abandoning God's commandments, from abandoning God Himself. And in fact, if you were to go back and to look at God's covenant with Israel in Deuteronomy 28, they're, they're warned time and time again of exactly what was to come if they didn't obey God's commands. In fact, if you were to take Deuteronomy chapter 28 and you are to lay it out next to Lamentations, you can see that they parallel each other in a number of different spots. And I want to kind of point that out. It's really important to understanding our text for today. You have to understand God's covenant and God's covenant love 
that he had with his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, it, it goes through this whole list, and it, and it starts out with these blessings. Like, hey, if you obey God's commands, here's the blessings that follow. And there's this, this decent-sized list of blessings, and then there's this longer section that's a list of curses or consequences that would come as a result of disobedience. Listen to a couple of verses here from Deuteronomy 28. Verse 1 starts out with a positive. It says, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And it sounds great, doesn't it? And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And notice both at the beginning of verse 1, the end of verse 2, that similar phrase that's there, if you obey, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God. And it was really important for them to understand this. And, and when these words are written and Moses writes the book of Deuteronomy, writes this down as this is given to the people of Israel, they're in the wilderness. They're wandering. They haven't even made it to the promised land yet. But God was letting them know before they ever stepped one foot in that it was critical that they follow His commands, that they obey the voice of the Lord your God. Later on in the chapter, as I mentioned, it gives some of the the consequences that would come if they didn't obey. And, and some of it, if you were to read through the whole of, of, of Deuteronomy 28, some of it's really tough to read. I, w- I want to give you kind of even just some of the PG verses, if you will, that are, that are there. But I want you to listen to it. It says, The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. If you don't obey, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you shall be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Verse 36 says this, The Lord will bring you in your king whom you set over you. When this is written, the idea of the king isn't even there yet. The Lord will bring you and your king whom you set over you to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone. Verse 41 gets a little more personal. It says, your father, you, you shall father sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity. Imagine that. Verse 52 says, They shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all your land. And that's exactly what happened. It's exactly what took place when uh, the kingdom split into two, into Israel and Judah. And they were defeated. The Babylonian Empire came in and defeated them tore all their walls down, and it's it's interesting to think about, as this is written, verse 52, the idea that they would even have towns with high and fortified walls was a pipe dream at that point. And probably they thought, like, man, if that ever happened, of course, if if we were blessed with that, we we would follow the Lord. We wouldn't walk away from the Lord. We would follow His commands. That's not what took place. And really, it was a picture of exactly what was coming down the line. Deuteronomy 28, it's filled with these kinds of warnings. Some are gruesome. But God wanted to clearly warn His people not to wander from Him. Not to indulge in the sins of the nations around them because of the consequences that would follow. Now, I know some of you are thinking like, man, this is just quite the depressing message so far. Don't worry, stick with me. It's going to get better, okay? Jeremiah knew of the warnings given, I'm sure, in in Deuteronomy 28. In fact, in those days, many would have known. They knew the the Old Testament law. And when you come to Lamentations chapter 3, Jeremiah begins this chapter by recognizing that the destruction and the afflictions uh, that both he and God's people endured were from God Himself. We don't like to think about that, but sometimes that's exactly what happens, is that the destruction and affliction that we deal with in our life comes from God as a consequence of our sin. That's what was taking place here. And what's interesting is you go through the beginning of chapter 3, and I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, but Jeremiah talks about it personally, 
And really, there, there's kind of this overflow of what's going on in his personal life to exactly what's going on in Jerusalem and in Judah as well. It starts out in verse 1, it says this, Jeremiah says, I am the man who has seen affliction. It says, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. Whose wrath? Under God's wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. That's exactly what Jeremiah is saying. It's like the, I'm dealing with all of these consequences. I'm dealing with this affliction. I'm under the rod of God's wrath. And the reality is this. In the moment... When we feel like God's against us because of the consequences of our sin, the reality is that the discipline that we experience is really a sign of God's great love. Parents, you know all about that, right? You discipline your children because you love them. You discipline out of love. In fact, Proverbs even tells parents, the one who doesn't discipline hates his child. And it's the same idea here. That the wrath of God, the discipline of God, was really a sign of His love. It was a sign of God's commitment to the covenant that He had made. And Jeremiah here was experiencing firsthand the wrath of God because the nation of Judah had not listened to the warnings. They hadn't listened to the warnings given in the law, and they hadn't listened to the warnings given by the prophets. Prophets like Jeremiah himself gave warnings time and time and time again. Jeremiah goes on throughout Lamentations 3 here describing the wrath of God. He says in verse 5 that God has besieged him with bitterness and tribulation, that he dwells in darkness. Verse 8 says that he shuts out his prayer. Verse 10, he talks about how God is like a bear or a lion in hiding. It's almost like he's looking to attack. And he continues to bring to mind again and again all of these incredible struggles that he endured. Jeremiah was, was thrown into a pit, left for dead. And as he brings all of these things to mind, you come down to verse 19 and the passage begins to take a shift. It says in verse 19, he says, Remember my affliction and my wanderings. You know, we, we, we often think of, of the prophets as individuals who were um, not quite flawless, but somewhat, right? We, we tend to lift, put them pretty high. And Jeremiah owns his own part here. Remember my affliction, the struggles, but remember my wanderings. The wormwood and the gall give some specific examples. And he says this, verse 20, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. What a great sign of humility. What a great recognition of how he is desperate for God. And as you come to verse 21, the whole text is about to take a shift because he says this in verse 21, but this I call to mind. He, he's gone through and he's listed all of these struggles for 20 verses all the difficulties that he's endured, all that's gone on not only in his life, but in Judah and in Jerusalem, all these difficulties, how they've wandered from God, how they've struggled. And he says this, with, even though all that stuff has gone on, even all of these things I'm dealing with right now in the moment, he says, this is what I call to mind, and therefore, this is why I have hope. And we come to our words to live by in verse 22. This is what I call to mind. He says, this is why I have hope. Because the steadfast love of the Lord never, never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
As you come to that text, it's, it's like you can almost hear Jeremiah lamenting, crying out to God in desperation. Even though I've gone through all of this, God, even though I'm dealing with all of these difficulties, even though because of my own sin in some areas, he's, he's like, listen, this is what I'm going to call to mind, that your steadfast love never ceases, your mercies never end, they're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And that's exactly what should take place in our own lives when we're in our deepest moments, in our greatest struggles. It should cause us to cry out to God and remember His faithfulness. That phrase at the beginning of verse 22, steadfast love, is a phrase we talked about going back to our Relationship Reset series. It's the word hesed. Uh, the ESV study Bibles that looked at that word in this passage said this, it's God's covenant mercy or beneficial action on His people's behalf. It, it's a loyal love. Okay, and, and, and that's where the connection is to Deuteronomy 28 goes back to God's covenant with His people. The covenant that He had made with them. And, and, and it's like, it's, this is a reminder, Jeremiah is like, i, I got to remember that God's steadfast, loyal love, His covenant love, never ceases. That even in the midst of all the destruction, God is still there. And even though he was dealing with personal afflictions as a resident of Jerusalem, what an awful place to be at that time, his hope was secure in knowing that God's covenant love, his steadfast love, never ceases. I love how Psalm 36, verse 5 puts it. It says this, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Very similar ideas and in both Lamentation 3 and in Psalm 36. It speaks of God's faithfulness. It speaks of His steadfast love. And the reality is this. God's steadfast love, His faithfulness, is greater than we can even imagine. He doesn't break His promises. He's faithful to His commitments. Even when we are unfaithful. I love what Malachi chapter 3 says about the character of the Lord. It says this, For I, the Lord, do not change. Whew, praise God for that. Because we sure seem to flip-flop all over the place. It says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. The reason why you're alive is is because God is faithful to His commitments, to His commands, to His covenants, to who He is, to His character. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from My statutes and have not kept them. Return to Me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. God doesn't change. He was faithful to His covenant with Israel, Judah, to His people, and He's faithful to us as followers of Christ. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it says this. It says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just a few verses before that, in chapter 12, verse 28, it says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The kingdom of Israel certainly was shaken, but God's kingdom is not shaken. The kingdoms of this world and the nations of this world will be shaken. God is not shaken. His kingdom is not shaken. Thus, therefore, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, with minds blown for who God is and for what He's done. For our God is a consuming fire. Look back at our text with me, Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. I don't know about you, but I, I generally try to be cautious 
with the word never or every or always. And I love that it's here because it's here for a reason and it speaks to the power of God and His character. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies or His compassions, His deep compassions never come to an end. They never fail. They are new every morning. Great is Your faithfulness. Listen, you you can have confidence that God not only allows the trouble to each day that is sufficient for that day, but He also allows the mercies which are tailor-made to carry that day's troubles. That is an amen. His mercies are new every morning. Why, Why are they new every morning? Why are they new every morning? Is it because they weren't good enough yesterday? Yesterdays were too weak? They were faulty? No, it's because they were yesterdays. Yesterday's mercies were for yesterday's struggles. Today's mercies are for today's struggles. They're new every morning. Bible Knowledge Commentary compared them to to manna in the wilderness for the people of Israel. What, what happened with manna? It was new every morning. What happened if you tried to keep it for the next day? It was no good. It was awful. God's mercies are like the manna in the wilderness. You can't keep it overnight. Enough comes for each day. And you live on God day by day or you don't live on God. You know, we need this truth that God's mercies are new every day. This truth gives you hope time and time and time and time and time again if you grasp it and live it. Because let's be honest, how many times do we come to the end of ourselves where we're ready to throw in the towel? Where we're saying, you know what, that's it, I'm done. I'm giving up. I'm out. Or we have this idea that just one more straw on this camel's back and it's going to break and we despair that tomorrow will be rolled into today's hopelessness. Listen, at that moment we desperately need this truth. God will not expect you to carry one more straw without the mercies needed to carry it. You need to remember that because a tough day is coming. Or maybe you're having one already. Or maybe you're in a difficult season right now. Listen, God will give you the mercies that you need to deal with those struggles. John Piper says this. He said, you will not be asked to live tomorrow on today's strength. What you need today is not tomorrow's strength, but today's faith that tomorrow's mercies will be new and will be enough. Listen, don't compound today's load with worrying about tomorrow's. Jesus said this very clearly in Matthew chapter 6. After going through the end of chapter 6, he he talks about how, listen, he says, if I take care of the flowers of the field... I take care of the birds, the sparrows. Don't you think I'm going to take care of you? And he says this, very last verse of Matthew chapter 6, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And listen, you know that to be true. You might have even told somebody that verse before. But when it's you who's in the driver's seat going through a tough day, It's a whole different story, isn't it? It's a whole lot more difficult to really contemplate the words of Jesus and to really have this idea that I cannot be anxious about tomorrow. I have to deal with today's situation and remember that God's mercies are exactly what I need. His compassions are what I need exactly for today and for this moment. Listen, you've got enough to deal with today without adding tomorrow's struggles. You 
You know, I've got to be honest, personally, I feel like in some ways I've probably needed this more in the last couple weeks than I have in a long time. I, 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 I've really felt like even all three of these, these messages, going back to Psalm 46 and Psalm 63, I, I, um, the weekend that Tanner was preaching, Memorial Day weekend, we had gone away for the weekend as a family, and I wasn't feeling well that Sunday morning at all. And, um, and uh, I was watching the service online, and I got done and I sent Tanner a, a text right after the first service and told him I needed that message. I don't know if anybody else did, but I knew I needed that message. I needed that reminder to be still, to surrender, to, to let go and let God. And I needed last week's reminder from Paul that whether days are good or bad, we need to choose to pour out God's praise, to have His praise on our lips. And as we've walked through our family, just a series of difficult days, and, and uh, watching Candace's mom pass, and we, we had the burial a couple days ago, um, I'll tell you, I've needed... I've needed each day's measure of God's mercies for each day's struggles. And I've needed that reminder that God gives us that exact measure that we need. This, this passage, this verse, verse 23, ends with the phrase, great is your faithfulness. And the word faithfulness is kind of an interesting word. This word is, is connected to the word um, amen, which means so be it. So the word amen, we use it to often close our prayers. But its, it's meaning in English is connected to truth or to faith, to, to trustworthiness. And with reference to God, this word only occurs during the exile or after the exile. And it has the idea of being constant of being reliable. It was a unique characteristic of the Lord. What's interesting is it's completely contrary to the nation of Israel. They were unfaithful. And the reality was, it wasn't until they were brought to their lowest point that they recognized how faithful God really was. And isn't that how it often goes? Often in life, we don't realize the faithfulness of God until the bottom's fallen out. Until we're at a point of desperation and we are lamenting in our own way and crying out to God. Listen, maybe that's you today. Maybe you feel like the bottom has fallen out. Maybe you feel like there's no hope. Listen, I, I want to encourage you with this. You may be down. But with God, you are never out. Never. You know, you've probably heard the phrase down and out, right? You may be down, but with God, you're never out. His mercies are new every morning. And great is His faithfulness. It's the result of this whole text. As you get to that phrase, great is your faithfulness, what Jeremiah is saying is because of his steadfast love that never ceases, because his mercies never come to an end, his compassions never come to an end, because they are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. There's only one response. But amen, so be it. I read this story this week about a missionary named John Vinson. In 1931, John Vinson was a missionary in North China. And an army of bandits swooped down on his village, looting, burning, and killing. They took 150 Chinese and Vinson captive. When the government troops pursued, the bandits offered Vinson his freedom if he would write a letter to the commanding officer of the government troops asking him to withdraw. Vincent said, will you let the Chinese prisoners go free? He wasn't just looking for his own freedom. He wanted the freedom of those with him. Certainly not, was the reply. 
Then I refused to go free, he said. That night, the bandits tried to flee, taking Vincent with them. Many were killed and many of the captives escaped. Vincent could not run because of a recent surgery. And a little Chinese girl later reported that a bandit pointed a gun at Vincent's head and said, I'm going to kill you. Aren't you afraid? You know, it's, it's at this point of the story that we often put ourselves in Vincent's shoes, in the individual's shoes. And, and, and we wonder if we would have the strength to die with peace in that moment. And the point of all that we've been talking about in Lamentations 3 is this. You don't have to feel that right now. What God wants from you now as you sit here today is not the strength to die John Vincent's death. That's not today's trouble for you. However, it may be tomorrow's. And what God calls you to now is not to have the power to do what Vincent would do but to have the trust in God that if your time comes, He will give you what you need. He'll give you the mercies needed for that day. By the way, Vincent looked up and said, No, I am not afraid. If you kill me, I will go straight to God. Which is exactly what happened. Today's mercies are for today's troubles. And tomorrow's mercies are for tomorrow's troubles. Deuteronomy 33, 25 says, as your days, so shall your strength be. God will give you what you need. And so the next time you're walking through a struggle or a difficulty and you think, I can't do it, I can't go on, I, God's giving you the mercies that you need for that day. He's giving you what you need to endure those struggles, those difficulties. And really, I think the question is this. Will you trust God? Can you trust that He'll be faithful? Can you say, great is your faithfulness? God, your steadfast love never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. And I'm going to trust God that today you're going to give me the mercies that are needed to accompany the troubles that will also come. Will you trust God that he will give you the mercies, the deep compassions needed to face each day, each morning. I'm often reminded of this verse in the morning. It often comes to mind in the morning. In having a time of prayer, it seems to pop into my mind quite often that as the sun comes up with each day, so comes God's mercies, which are new. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And then he says this in verse 24. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. God, as we come before you today, I know there are hurts and there are pains in the room. There's those who are watching online that may be enduring incredible struggles. I pray that this would simply be a reminder for them today that your mercies are new today and that your, com your compassions are new, that there are enough for what they need to handle today's situations. God, we, we are overwhelmed by your character. We worship, as it said there in Hebrews 12, with reverence and awe. God, you're faithful. 
even when we're faithless. You're faithful even when we wander. We're, you're, you're faithful, God, when we choose sin. You remain faithful to your commitment to us. And so, God, we ask and pray that if there's those who are wandering, that they would recognize it. If they're dealing with incredible consequences, I hope it would pause, help them pause and stop and consider that maybe these are consequences and afflictions that they are dealing with because of your great love for them. And for those who are going through struggles, for each of us, God, may we be reminded that with the rising of the sun and with a new day comes new mercies. We praise you for your mercies, for your deep compassion. And God, we ask and pray that we would remember that as we face struggles and difficulties in life, that you have given us exactly what we need to face that day. So God, we praise you and we thank you. And we say, great is your faithfulness. In Jesus' name. Amen.